What does Hebrews 6 verse 4 mean? This is one of those verses that you'll hear all the time if you say a Christian cannot lose their salvation. They'll say, well, what about Hebrews 6? And as I demonstrated in my video earlier about 1 John, there are certain passages that you can't just snatch out of scripture and have it stand alone. So for all the people that have been confused on Hebrews 6, let's read what the scriptures are saying. And all I'm saying is let all men be liars and let God be true. Now Hebrews 6 starts with therefore. And if you've ever been a part of my Bible studies, I tell you, we don't start with that word. I've never started any sentence or thought with therefore. So we gotta go back if we're gonna go for the context of what's being talked about. What is the beginning of this monologue, of this moment? And it's at the end of chapter five, after talking about Jesus being the fulfillment of the high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, which may I say is a very deep and complex topic. He says about this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So before we get into this therefore statement, we see the author of Hebrews saying, I would love to keep going down this path. I have so much to say to you on these deep issues. However, you don't even understand the basic principles. And by now you should. After this rebuke, he then says, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. What's being said here? Stop repeating the elementary principles because there's people there that keep needing to be taught it. You are hurting those that are ready to move forward and you're doing something that will not produce any fruit. Listen to what he's about to say. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. What is the elementary doctrine of Christ? Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings and laying of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are the basic principles of the oracles of God. In modern language, if your church every single week had to keep preaching the very basics of who Jesus is to the same people, this is someone saying, you need to stop and move on. Your response might be, well, no, there's some people that they're just struggling to really grasp that. He's got a response to that. Let's watch. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. These people who have walked with us, felt the presence of God, the Holy Spirit pooling on their heart, these people that have rejected this time and time again, and you keep having to go back to the elementary doctrines, they're not going to come back. You're wasting your time. How do I know that we're not talking about a saved believer? How do I know that this is what he means? Because I keep reading. Watch. For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Why did he just give this analogy? What is this analogy of two fields? He uses a field that produces crop and a field that's thorn and thistles, and no matter what, produces nothing. A moment ago, he said if they've already tasted in these things, shared in these things, and heard these things, it's impossible to bring them back. They are the field of thorns and thistles. You can toss seeds, the seeds get crunched. You can plant seeds in water, nothing grows. This is Matthew 13. Some seeds sprout up, receiving it with joy, but then fall away on account of persecution of the word, because the seed never took root. So here's the author of Hebrews, who I believe is Luke writing a sermon that Paul gave, but that's neither here nor there, using the same language that Jesus constantly uses in scripture. So let's go back for a second. And let me ask you if this looks familiar. In John chapter five, 5,000 people were following Jesus. He then fed them with loaves and fish that he manifested out of thin air. He then walked on water and crossed the sea and they followed him in boats. 
He then preached a hard message and they walked away. And they said, Lord, they're leaving. He responded by no one comes to me unless the father draws them. I ask you right now, if someone said, I'm gonna go pursue them and try and convince them to come back, would you say that's a good idea or a bad idea? I would argue that it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Yes, they can have a repentance. No one's saying that the word repentance only belongs to the salvation of man. Rome was trying to force Christians to repent of Christ. Men were being baptized for repentance before Jesus showed up because John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. That word repentance doesn't mean that they were saved. This is saying it's impossible if you've already given all this to get them to come, which we need to be aware of in our walk. Sometimes we preach to people as if even if they reject God's word and the Holy Spirit pulling on their heart, if I say one more thing, maybe it'll be convincing enough for them. Bro, if, he, if they reject God, they're rejecting you. The land that has drunk the rain that falls on it and produces a crop is useful. But the one that bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Do not waste your time. Like I hate to break it to you, but the early church had no problem with sending you away from the church. It might be what's best for you sometimes too. Remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul said, turn that man over to Satan so that his body be destroyed and his soul be saved. If somebody is in constant rejection of God's word, constantly needing the same instruction, never fully grasping what God has been trying to give them, that might be a problem between them and God. You should not be sitting there wasting your time pouring the same water on the same field and expecting a new thing to produce. God has given you this water. Go forth and plant and water. Don't sit there pouring it all out in the same spot. And now here's the key part because it cracks me up when people go here to say you can lose your salvation. Hebrews 6 does the opposite. It actually affirms the security we have in Christ. When he's talking about this person, it's the case of those people. But then he switches up his audience. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Their case is much different than our case. Why? For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. He then goes on emphasizing why we have this hope because God swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. He goes on to say, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, that's us, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Ephesians 1, you've been guaranteed. You have a guarantee, a seal of guarantee. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this whole area opens up when he mentions Jesus comes after Melchizedek and says, and I would love to keep telling you about this, but some of y'all have become dull of hearing. He then rebukes them and says, you stop wasting your time with them. Then he turns around and says, you have something to hope in. You, in your case, are locked in because God cannot lie and he sealed you with a guarantee. And then points back to Jesus being our forerunner, the one who goes ahead of us as our high priest forever. Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews 6 preaches eternal security in Christ Jesus, our anchor and steadfast hope, our forerunner, our high priest. As it continues in Hebrews 9, he makes constant intercession on my behalf. And Hebrews 11, he is the founder and perfecter of my faith. Hebrews 10, that by one sacrifice, he has perfected for all time those being sanctified. So there's your answer. God bless and go in peace.